Hello, BookTube. I did indeed get more mail. So I thought we'd go through it together. Uh, no boxes this time around. Plenty of cardboard. Plenty of cardboard to suit me. <laughs> so let's, let's see if there's anything squeal worthy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Where will we put our discards? What is this? Okay, this is Yale Margellos. They are uh, the translation uh, arm of Yale University Press. They do some really interesting stuff. Uh, and this is coming out in a week. <coughs> and it is a Greek ballad. Uh, and despite that title, the subtitle is Collect Selected Poems. Uh, and this is by Michalis Ganas, translated from the Greek by David Connolly and Joshua Barley. So it's a Greek ballad. And then the subtitle is Many Ballads, Many Poems. This is the first English language collection of work by the renowned Greek poet. Originally from a remote village on the Albanian border, he witnessed the Greek Civil War as a young child and was taken into enforced exile in Eastern Europe with his family. Weaving together subtle references to the events and places that have defined his life stories, the, author terse, the author's terse and technically accomplished poems are a combination of folklore, autobiography, and mythology. I wonder if it's bilingual. Oh, it is. Oh, look at that. It is incredible. <laughs> okay, fantastic. I'm very, we're, so we're, we're starting on a very strong note. We're starting with the first English language translation of a certain thing. Great. Uh, so let's move on. Let's, let's see what else we have here. Okay, I think, I think we saw this already. Uh, this is probably due any day now. Oh no, this is due in late October. This is edited by Robert Pinsky, and it is The Mind Has Cliffs of Fall, Poems at the Extremes, at the Extreme of Feeling. Uh, and once again, the title is a mystery. <laughs> we have, we have uh, a Greek ballad, which is singular, followed by selected poems, and then we have The Mind Has Cliffs of Fall which is gibberish. So, so we're not doing well for titles. Once again, I want to stress to those of you in the industry who are watching, Steve's services at providing good titles for your books are available free of charge any time of the day or night. <laughs> uh, let's see here, though. Well, I think it's been a while since we looked at this, though. Uh, despair, mania, rage, guilt, derangement, fantasy. Sounds like the first, third, and fifth of my marriages to Deb. <laughs> Poetry is our most intimate personal source for the urgency of these experiences. Poems get under our skin. They engage with the balm and the sting of understanding. Uh, and this book, the title inspired by Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, uh, has acclaimed poet Robert Pinsky giving us more than 130 poems that explore emotion at its most expansive, distinct, and profound. Okay. All right, so uh, this is actually a slim volume of poetry. So uh, we we uh, we could technically do this next Tuesday. We could we could dip into this for a couple of Tuesdays and see what we make of Robert Pinsky as an editor. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that. Uh, haven't had a, got a poetry anthology like that in quite some time, other than the uh, the best American poetry. I got that volume. Uh, let's see here. Oh my! Oh goodness! Okay, this also comes out any day now. This is a novel translated from the Irish by Alan Titley. Uh, this is The Dregs of the Day in the finished paperback. So this is going to be a paperback with the, with the French flaps. Uh, this is also from the Yale Margellos. The, the Margellos, they do, that's where they do their translating. Uh, and this comes out on the, it's dated the 24th of September, but this won't have a strict on sale, so uh, it could be... Uh, Okay, this novella follows a widower as he attempts to plan his wife's funeral arrangements without money, direction, or whiskey. Thrown into a desert of unknowing, he knows not where to turn or what to do. Okay, <laughs> all right, fantastic. And this likewise has a ton of blurbs. Okay, great. I have the advanced copy of this, and I haven't got to it, even though it's only days away. Uh, but I will, now that I have the finished copy. Uh... All right, let's press on. Let's press on. Try and get these mail halls done in less than four years. Oh, my. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay. All right. This is due on October 1st, <laughs> but I'm going to be reading it right away. <laughs> this is A Mrs. Miracle Christmas by Debbie McComber. Uh, look at that. There's a dog coming out of a box. 
since that will not, I'm sure, be the, first, the last time that we see such an image during this holiday or the extended holiday season, allow me to put in my vote right now, my strong admonition right now, do not under any circumstances whatsoever ever give a dog as a present. Never, ever do it. <laughs> Never, ever do it. You wouldn't snatch a baby out of a nursery ward and give it to someone as a Christmas present. Oh, aren't babies cute? You wouldn't do that because you'd be thinking, I'm actually not giving this person, the recipient, a cute little baby. I'm giving them a 70-year responsibility. Well, okay. <laughs> Dogs live for 16 years, if you're lucky. And some of those years won't be easy. Don't ever give a living thing as a present to anyone. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure the author didn't pick this cover. Uh, no one can capture the Christmas spirit like beloved women's fiction author Debbie McComber. Okay, that's not true on a couple of reasons. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of people who can capture the Christmas spirit just as well. And she's not a women's fiction author. What does that mean? I love her as much as anybody. <laughs> anyway, uh, to many, Debbie's Christmas stories are just as much a part of the holiday season as putting up the tree, lighting the fire, decking the halls, and gathering with friends and loved ones. I actually know lots of readers of this author for whom that is true. <laughs> and uh, that list... Uh, putting up the tree, lighting the fire, decking the halls, and gathering with friends and loved ones. In South Boston, that there's one item that would be added to that list, and that is raking up old family recriminations. <laughs> uh, readers will not be disappointed in this new tale featuring one of Debbie's most beloved characters, Mrs. Miracle. Since her debut in 1996, Mrs. Miracle has brought a joyful helping of Christmas magic to readers. Oh boy. Okay. Well, I don't need to be sold on Debbie McComber, so I will read this. This is a, a publication date of October the 1st, uh, which I think is a Tuesday, since judging by the fact that 400 books that I've seen so far are coming out on that same day. Uh, and Tuesday is the new book release date uh, in America. But I don't need much in the way of an inducement to read this author, so that's great. All right. Uh, let's see here. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, I just got uh, an email about this book. Um, goodness gracious, this has a map and everything. Fancy schmancy. Uh, this is, I believe we've seen this already. This is an October book, if I remember correctly. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yes, mid-October. Uh, let's see here. This is Timothy Egan. This is a pilgrimage to eternity. From Canterbury to Rome in search of faith. In the finished copy. Lovely finished copy. I don't think yours will come with a map. <laughs> I'm pretty sure not, but I could be wrong. Uh, in the wake of his mother's death, and shortly after the 2016 presidential election, best-selling author Timothy Egan was looking to take refuge in history. He had done a lot of time traveling in prior books, and always found comfort in the past. At the same time, the Catholic Church was facing its worst crisis since the Reformation, and he wondered whether the verities of Christianity could hold this faith together. I'm sure they can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Scandals and crises are human. Sure they can. The faith can hold it together. Uh, for Egan, a New York Times journalist and author, it was a personal question, as well as a journalistic one. For clerical abuse had hit close to home, and as an Irish Catholic, even with the lasting pain that the church had caused his family, he remained open to the tenets of faith. To find answers, Egan decided to embark on an adventure of a lifetime and walk one of the oldest pilgrimage routes in the world, the 1,000-mile-long trek from Canterbury to Rome. On this journey, he wanted to find, as he says in A Pilgrimage to Eternity, a stiff shot of no BS spirituality. Okay. Pilgrimages have done that for people from, a, from time immemorial. I myself think, uh, I, naturally, since I'm, to, I'm now a totally sedentary creature, I think that such things happen within. <laughs> but, but, any, uh, but anyway. Uh, so this list said uh, sort of a bulleted list of things that you can that are happening in the book. The, the incredibly secular nature of Europe, for instance. The Europe has never been more secular than it is today. Faith is on the decline everywhere, except in, this, in the, the heart of the most insane country in the world, which is not Wahhabi Saudi Arabia, but is actually the United States of America, where one half of the population of this country does not, quote-unquote, believe in evolution. <laughs> one half the population of this country believes that uh, they are watched over all the time by supernatural beings. That, whose names they know and who they can talk with. And uh, closing in on a full third of this country believes that 
medical science is a racket. That it's fake. That it's the equivalent of fake news. And that you shouldn't have your children vaccinated. You shouldn't go to a hospital for illness of any kind. Just don't pay any attention to it. Don't use sunscreen on you or your children. Because there's no such thing as skin cancer. It hasn't happened to me this week. So I don't believe it's real at all or ever has been. And the Earth is 6,000 years old. And the sun and the moon are the same size. They both emit light. And they're both up in the sky just about six miles off the surface of the Earth. That's a third of the country that believes that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, what other, what other uh, points can we have here? Uh, talks about more other spiritual cleansing rituals. Uh, Egan's determination to meet Pope Francis, to understand him, to see if his family can forgive, is at the core of his pilgrimage. Interesting. Is he able to forgive? Well, if he's not able to forgive. He has no right to be on pilgrimage. Uh, anyway, uh, this is an October book. This this comes out in October, so I have a finished copy now. And the finished copy, quite apart from my fancy schmancy map, is quite nice. Uh, okay, so let's let's move on. We're doing fine. This is this is the second mail haul today. But we're doing just fine. Uh, let's see. Let's see what this next one is. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> what a juxtaposition. Not intended on the part of the publishers, but oh my. We saw this already, and I, I have been strongly tempted to read it. It just hasn't made the roulette wheel. I've, I've read ahead in many, many books, but not this one. <clears throat> this comes out in a week. This is by me, Megan Phelps Roper, and it is called Unfollow, a memoir of loving and leaving the Westboro Baptist Church. So we have the opposite ends of religiosity, of Christianity here on display. Uh, this has blurb uh, from Chris Anderson, who's the head of the TED Talks. It has a blurb from Sam Harris, <coughs> and it has a blurb from Sarah Silverman. Uh, and it also has a, th a strong thumbs up from Kirkus Review, but I promise that was not me. <laughs> uh, and that is all we get here. We, that's all we get is just a page full of blurbs. Oh no, even more blurbs. Good lord. Okay. Uh, so, a blurb from Nick Hornby, a blurb from Ron John, uh, John Ronson, who did So You've Been Publicly Shamed, uh, but no, uh, no actual uh, description, but you hardly need one. This is, this is a scion of the Westboro Baptist Church, which even those of you who are not in America will probably recognize uh, as the frothing mouth uh, squint-eyed lunatics who, uh, who intentionally make incendiary signs and protest at the unloading of dead soldier bodies at, at uh, abortion clinics, at the, the funerals of soldiers, the funerals of they, they, they are an in, an in your face, small, toxic little splinter of uh, revivalist, fundamentalist Bible Belt American Christianity uh, and they can be very disturbing. It is very disturbing for instance to uh, to listen to a couple of the members of the church, not Fred Phelps, who was the its its foremost spokesman until he was dragged with boat hooks down to hell, uh, but a couple of the other spokesmen for the church, there there are clips of them on YouTube, there are clips of them that surface in the news, and they have a chilling certainty about them. It is, it is chilling, and uh, I don't know I don't know what Megan Phelps Roper is like. I don't I don't really know uh, her story. She is fairly young, uh, but it has been. Uh, widely and correctly pointed out that the Westboro Baptist Church is not actually doing anything that is contrary to Christian doctrine. It, but enemies of, of the Christian Church point that out with great alacrity. <laughs> that that these, these people who have such hateful signs in public uh, aren't actually heretics. There is a read. The, the whole point here, the easy, the easy read here, is that that means that all Christians are bad, as bad as the Westboro Baptist Church. And the nuanced reading is that all faiths are are multifaceted, and that you can you can pull out of them, construct from them, a life blueprint of radically different kinds. As I've said on this channel many times, the best people that I've ever known in my life have been Christians, believe in practicing Christians. And also the worst people I've ever known in my life have been believing, practicing Christians. So I think that that firmly demonstrates um, that, you know, it's what you make of it. And the only reason that I think more Christians don't embrace that idea is because that idea points straight at their faith being malleable. 
And if their faith is malleable, then their faith is then the, the 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 question surfaces right away. Those of, those of us who don't have faith can see it from a mile off. It is to us as plainly obvious as the stone carvings on the Parthenon. And that realization is that this was all made up. That that's the reason why you can pull radically different viewpoints from it, because. It's, it's all invented by humans and it's just as malleable as humans are and it wouldn't be that way if it were uh, the spiritual bequest of an omnipotent perfect being it wouldn't be that way that wouldn't even be possible you would either have no Westboro Baptist churches or you would all be the Westboro Baptist church Christians don't particularly like to hear that but uh, it gives me solace because it, it means that I am free and it's not just Christianity of course it's any religion I am free to look at, at each individual adherent and say okay well you are using this as a as a, a, a crutch a prop also a source of strength to enhance qualities that are inside of you so I will be able to tell from your use of your faith what your inner qualities are like and I'll almost never be wrong Th that is one way that 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 faith is a very great advantage to know in someone uh, but anyway, anyway, I can't wait to read this. This is this whole mail hall so far has been by uh, books that I can't wait to read. Uh, so let's let's see what this next one is. What have we got here? It's stuck inside one of these envelopes. With a adhesive on every side, so that you have to tear it apart in order. See if I don't do this, this is sticky. So if I don't do this, it's going to stick to every single thing. In the place, you don't want this sticking to Frida, do you? Oh, you don't want this sticking to Frida? My little baby Frida? Oh, you don't. She got all upset this morning because there was a bird out in the on the on the grass and it was bothering her because it wasn't paying any attention to her. She got so upset, poor little thing, that she hopped down onto the floor and started going and, and threw up a little puddle of bile. <laughs> it wasn't it was it break my heart. She never ever has any kind of physical problems. I think this might be the only time I've ever seen her throw up. I went, you know, you do what you do. You go over and you hold the dog. And uh, I I soothed her through it. It was nothing. It was trivial. Dogs throw up as a matter of course. They'll let you know when it's serious. But I I over worried anyway. Uh, oh oh what, oh good oh, goodness gracious! Look at this. Here I am going on and on about Frida when I've got romances <laughs> I've got romances to tell you about here oh my god it's three of them okay I've got three romances in a row here and they're all mass market paperbacks god almighty I love my job uh, okay this is uh, the first in a series this is the first in the Forgotten Empire series by Jeff Kennedy is this actually new and it is called The Orchid Throne that is the mass market paperback cover uh, let's see here. In the Forgotten Empires, magic is forbidden. Dreams are destiny, and love is the greatest power of all. As queen of the island kingdom of Calanthe, Leah will do anything to keep her people free and her secrets safe from the mad tyrant who rules the mainland. Guided by a magic ring of her father's, Leah plays the political game with the cronies the, empire, the emperor sends to her island. In her heart, she knows that it's up to her to save herself from her fate as the Emperor's bride. Oh my god. So he doesn't just say emperors, emissaries. He wants to marry her. Uh, but in her dreams, she sees a man, one with the power to build a better world. A man whose spirit is as strong and whose passion is as fierce as her own. And then we split to a new paragraph where I suspect we're going to meet that man. <laughs> Conry, former crown prince of Oriel, has built an army to overthrow the Emperor, but he needs the fabled abiding ring to succeed. The ring that Leah holds so dear to her heart. When the two banished rulers meet face to face, neither can deny flames of rebellion that flicker in their eyes, nor the fires of desire that draw them together. Oh, wow! So this is a uh, fantasy romance. And does, when do we have this? comes out uh, in a week. Okay, great. Uh, then we have Laura Lee. And this is a brute force novel. This is Lethal Nights. Also at first time in print. Look at that. Very good. Purple cover. Ilya Dragonovich, a.k.a. Dragon, is no stranger to the dark side. As a safe house owner for security agency Brute Force, Dragon knows that the battle line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man, and sometimes a beautiful woman. Emma Jane Preston needs help, 
After her marriage crumbled, she believed she could get back to no a normal, happy life. But now she needs the kind of protection that comes at a cost, one that only someone like Dragon can provide. But can Emma Jane trust this handsome, undercover operator to keep her safe when she is in danger of falling into the arms of the deeply seductive, fiery dragon and never letting go? Oh my. <laughs> and then this last one, the last of these romances, is one that we've seen before. I got it as a trade paperback, but here it is as the mass market that it will be uh, in, late, in, in a week. Uh, this is Highland Jewel, a Royal, and Hi a Royal Highlander novel by Mae McCaldrey. We saw this already as a trade paperback. This is going to be, look at that lovely thing. That is just a lovely cover. Again, with the, uh, with the purple. We've got the purple theme going on here. Uh, Maisie Murray's sweet, docile exterior masks mas the courageous spirit of a firebrand determined to champion women's suffrage with like-minded friends. But fighting for her principles has swept her directly into harm's way and into the arms of a man she can't resist. Trained officer in the Royal Highlands Regiment, Neil Campbell has spent his life serving the crown. Battle-weary and searching for peace, he wants nothing to do with trouble until he meets Maisie. But unless Neil and Maisie can find a way to stand up to the destructive forces that threaten to divide them, long-buried secrets and political schemes are destined to stand in the way of the glorious love they've found. <laughs> All right, so three romances. Uh, and then the last thing is going to be very hard for this last item to match three romances, but we'll give it a try and see. Uh, oh my! Oh boy! Oh boy! Okay, this is a this is another one of those unfortunate books that comes out in December. Right when it comes out in December, it's long too. It's a long book. It's what? What have we got here? Six hundred pages. So what are you gonna do? I mean, you gotta hope. You gotta hope that book section editors will be open-minded about this sort of thing, uh, because otherwise, uh, <laughs> it's gonna get lost. Except by me, I won't. I won't ignore it. Uh, okay, this is by Carol Slenica, Sklenica, uh, and this is Alice Adams' Portrait of a Writer. Big thick thing coming out in in December. Uh, this is the author of Raymond Carver, A Writer's Life, uh, which I hated, but that could be just that I hate Raymond Carver. Uh, let's see here. In this new book, Sklenica turns her scrupulous attention to Alice Adams, a beloved but perhaps currently underappreciated writer who, in her novels and short stories, chronicled the sexual revolution and women's lives from the 1950s to the 1990s. I don't think there's any perhaps about her being unappreciated. She's unknown. I think she's certainly unappreciated. Uh, she was par particularly deft with female friendships, and in her most well-known novel, Superior Women, she traces the lives of four close friends from their days at Rad as Radcliffe undergrads through late middle age. As the author deftly shows in this new and illuminating biography, Adam's life was no less eventful or rich than her fiction, matching the tumultuous times she depicted. Fantastic. And it, this... this uh, this pup sheet also tells me that Scribner is going to reissue Superior Women in December. Isn't that wonderful? That's, that's what writer biographies ought to do that all the time, especially if it's a writer who has slipped from notice. But even not. Like, for instance, Benjamin Moser's big new biography of Susan Sontag. How much I would have loved it if that same publisher, or whoever had the rights, had come out with a barrage of her books in, in affordable paperbacks at about the same time. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Same thing with, you know, anybody from Booth Tarkington all the way to Alice Adams. So, so I'm glad that, that Superior Women is coming out. I hope I get it. hope I get a copy. Great. So this comes out in December. A bit, one, of the, one of the year's last big fat biographies. Wonderful. Uh, and we're just going to ignore. We're going to calmly and patiently ignore the blemish on the cover. <laughs> we're just going to ignore the blemish and concentrate on our author instead. What's wrong with these people? <laughs> so there you go. Quite a mail haul. Uh, so we have Alice Adams, a big new biography of Alice Adams. We have Unfollow by Megan Phelps Roper and A Pilgrimage to Eternity by Timothy Egan, an unintentional juxtaposition, but still I'm, I'm chuckling just a bit. Uh, we have The Mine Has Cliffs of Fall, a poetry anthology by uh, Robert Pinsky. We'll see. Maybe we dip into that next week. Uh, the Dregs of the Day, in a lovely trade paperback. It's going to be a trade paperback in your bookstores. Uh, a Greek Ballad, the, ver the very first English language translation of this author. Uh, and a whole bunch of romances. There's a Mrs. Miracle Christmas by Debbie McComber. 
there's uh, The Orchid Throne by uh, Jeff Kennedy. There's Lethal Knights by Laura Lee. And there's uh, Highland Jewel by Mae McCaldrick. So you have it all. You have big fat biographies, poetry, history, biography, and romance. So, wonderful. <laughs> Steve, is, Steve is quite pleased. Again, this has been a, a banner day for books. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, book two.